it's so called. Um, greetings to you all after the, the short stint of a recession that we had. Um, we coming back uh, after many uh, revelations are there in the media space, uh, especially on the corruption that has happened during this lockdown that we are experiencing and the pandemic of COVID-19 that has engaged our country. We are coming here today in our meeting to deal with those allegations and to with the investigations that have been happening. And through all that, we also heard that the DG has been suspended. We now have an acting DG. So our meeting today is going to deal with that. Um, the president was very clear what, yes, uh, he also agrees that amidst all of that, trying to ensure that uh, the country is safe, PPEs are secured, but corruption did okay. We can't, as the people that have been given mandates by the electorate, uh, keep quiet and turn a blind eye. So today we have to pick and, and take out all those elements of corruption, hoping that the DG and the minister will assist us in giving us um, the, the information. So you are all welcome in, in this meeting. Uh, it's only three hours and natures and, and reports of this nature, we would uh, require like five hours, not only three hours. So that means we are going to be very strict in terms of times. We all know uh, on the first round, you are given only three minutes. And then on the second round, it's, it's, it's a minute uh, when you are having a follow up uh, question. We can then Nola um, present the, the the agenda, and two, we get any apologies uh, that we have other than the one. Uh, I think Minister will come on that one. But we we have heard that the the DM has lost her mother. Uh, we we send uh, heartfelt condolences uh, to DM Kivitis family and may he find strength and comfort in the God's word during these trying times. Uh, any apologies, uh, Miss Martinez? I'm, I'm trying to be used to this name. Miss Martinez, any apologies from our side? Um, good morning, Chairperson. Thank you very much. And good morning to honorable members, honorable minister our colleagues from the parliamentary team, as well as the department. Um, we do have a couple of apologies, Chairperson. Uh, one is from the Honorable Kobane. She's attending a funeral today. And the second one is from Mr. Chuaku. Uh, he's, he also won't be able to attend. Just another one, uh, the Honorable Thring will be joining us a little later around 10 o'clock due to other commitments. That should be all from my side in terms of apologies, Chairperson. And if I may um, go through the agenda of today's meeting, um, we well, have. We, before you go to the agenda, can we get the the apologies from the from the select committee? Remember, we're having a joint committee. Apologies, Chair. I would like to hand over to my colleague from the NCOP for apologies. Good morning. Good morning, members, colleagues. We don't have any apologies so far. I don't know, maybe the chairperson, they might send through the chairperson, but on my side, they don't receive anything. Thank you. Hello. Thank you, Chair. I think the only apology that we received was from our question. Okay, okay. Can, can, thank you, thank you. But can the person. Sorry, good morning. May I interject? Um, oh. 
I know, she's but losing. on the line, I didn't submit oh, it. Oh, <laughs> sure. Can, 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 uh, sorry, members, uh, honorable members, can the person who is hosting us uh, control, can the person who is controlling, who is the host, uh, mute, please. There are so many people that have not muted uh, their mics. We we have to respect each other. At least we have one. Uh, hey, one of here, sure. so we no longer have. Can, can the uh, as one who has uh, apologized. Members, so we uh, take uh, that members, can the they person are no, who is uh, apologizing uh, from the uh, side of control of the side 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 of um, and we've already done apologies so and we will have a presentation from the minister regarding the suspension of the and which may be related to the and the thereafter we will have a presentation of the and the agenda is ready to have a your condolences to her. Uh, Chairperson, I'm joined by the acting DG um, Faisal, uh, MTS Faisal, and also our uh, direct, Deputy Director General Clark Michiza from Corporate Services. Um, chairpersons, members, um, I, will, I will do a, a short presentation on the precautionary suspension of the uh, the DG, and then uh, acting DG will do the presentation on the Bay Bridge border. So thank you for the opportunity. Um, Chairperson, on the 28th of July, 2010, uh, 2020, um, I placed the DG of the Department of Public Works and Infrastructure, uh, Advocate Sam Bukala, on precautionary suspension uh, effective as from the 29th of July 2020, pending the finalization of the disciplinary processes instituted against the DG. Uh, members will recall uh, this action followed a minute I received uh, from President Cyril Namaposa on the 17th of March 2020 to inform me of his decision to delegate his powers to uh, the minister to initiate a disciplinary process against the director general. Uh, what followed then is that the office of the state law advisor appointed a legal firm, Cheadle, Thompson and Hasem, uh, to assist with, with the matter. Um, this pr process uh, follows um, two reports um, that I received into two investigations. A report by PricewaterCoopers, which investigated um, allegations of irregularities related to the provision of movable infrastructure for official funerals that occurred uh, during the year 2018. The second report uh, was a report by the Public Service Commission, uh, which investigated allegations of irregular appointments uh, within the senior management service of the department that also occurred in 2018. 
The precautionary suspension of the DG shall remain in effect as until, until such time as the disciplinary hearing has been finalized and the allegations has been tested. Uh, such hearing also in accordance with section 27, that's, uh, um, item 2.72C of chapter seven of the senior management handbook must commence within 60 days of the date of delivery of the letter to the director general. Honorable members, I sought legal advice and assistance to start the process as directed in the minute of, of the president. An internal disciplinary process that will be chaired by a senior advocate will also be convened in due course. In order to protect the integrity of the process and the rights of the Director General Advocate Sam Bukela, in terms of the Labor Relations Act, um, I prefer that no further comment will be made until the process has been concluded uh, to protect the rights of the uh, Director General. Honorable Chairpersons, uh, that is my, my short presentation. I thank you. Um, thank you, Minister. Um, then, uh, honorable members, please just note so that we get the two records. Um, we have enough time for e, e, e deliberations. Um, then we would ask uh, Acting DG to present the, the second uh, report. Can you just ask for permission so we can share the presentation? Um, Chairperson, maybe share the presentation on the screen. Okay, Nola, can you do that? Yes, Chair, let me do that. The agreement was that uh, Corpus was going to do it on his side. I'm uh, saying that there's. Uh, she must just give me the. Yes, she said so. Yeah. It's not a problem. I'll show you from my side, Chair. Okay. Yes. Can you manage? Um, is it appearing properly? I'm not sure. I can see it perfectly. Is it uh, visible to everyone? Thank you very much, uh, Chairperson, with your permission. Yes, you may continue. Thank you very much, uh, Chairperson, and good morning to uh, you, Chairperson, and members of the committee. Uh, Chairperson, in terms of this particular presentation, on slide three, there are six different categories of, uh, of the table of contents. Uh, we give uh, some kind of background, if no luck, can go to slide number three. The background, the findings of the investigations, the recommendations arising from the investigation, the uh, due process we are going to follow pursuant to the conclusion of the investigation, our ongoing engagements with the portfolio committee, together with uh, other institutions conducting uh, implementation of some of the recommendations, then also a recommendation to the committee. Uh, Chairperson, I move on to slide number five, the first substantive area of the presentation. On the 15th of March, 2020, the, the president announced a national state of disaster. And that particular day is important because it gave rise to certain events where on Monday, the 16th of March, 2020, the minister 
issued a directive to the Director General, Advocate Vokela, directing him to appoint a service provider to uh, uh, use uh, emergency uh, procurement processes to erect a border fence in the vicinity of the Bay Bridge border post. Now, what transpired there in the directive of the minister? The minister referred to section 27.2 of the Disaster Management Act instead of section 64 of the Public Finance Management Act, which refers to executive directives. The investigation then found that the relevant directive in terms of the disaster management regulations through which the minister could have issued such a directive was issued two days later on the 18th, two days after the minister issued this particular directive. Moving on to slide six, the border fence uh, project, the total contracted amount for the border fence project was 40.4 million rand, and this was comprised of 37.1 million for construction purposes, which was payable to the contractor, and 3.250 million rand for professional services and project management, which was payable to a principal agent. This amount was calculated as a percentage of the value of the construction project, which, which essentially is a percentage of about 8.75% of the 37 million rands. Now, these contracts were awarded respectively to the contractor on the 25th and the principal agent on the 26th of March, 2020, and the procurement process or method used was called a negotiated procurement method, which is to negotiate with a sole service provider. Now, what has transpired is we were informed that the minister was informed that the cost of this project was in the region of 37 million rand, uh, and it was only much later that the minister was informed that there was a principal agent involved, which added to the cost and brought it to in excess of 40 million rands. Now, what transpired, uh, Chairperson and members of the committee, is that on the 20th of April, um, after receiving uh, reports of uh, irregularities, alleged, alleged irregularities on this particular project, the minister referred uh, the matter to the Auditor General on the 20th of April, 2020, requesting the Auditor General to conduct an independent audit into the border fence project and to commission an external audit that covered all areas of the project, including value for money. And on the 25th, Saturday, the 25th of April, 2020, the minister also requested the department's anti-corruption unit to conduct an investigation. And uh, the minister requested that the investigation should cover all aspects of the project, as well as certain specific areas where the minister had a concern with respect to the procurement processes that were followed. In this regard, also on the same day, the minister then uh, commissioned a moratorium through the anti-corruption unit of all payments uh, made to the principal agent and the uh, construction contractor. And on the 25th of, of, of April, the chief financial officer and the relevant staff in the construction branch were instructed not to make any further payments to any of the service providers to mitigate any further financial risk and the conclusion of the investigation. Now, Chairperson and members of the committee, the investigation team from the department was constituted of two members of the uh, anti-corruption unit, as well as members of the special investigating unit who were seconded to assist the uh, team to conduct the investigation, as well as members of the technical unit of the PICC, the Presidential Infrastructure Coordinating Commission Technical Unit, four individuals undertook a technical evaluation of the border fence installation. So those individuals then constituted the broader investigation team. Now, a draft report uh, after the 25th, the investigation unfolded. And on the 19th of March, 2020, on slide uh, number eight, on 19th of March, 2020, the... Uh, investigation team uh, concluded uh, the work and issued a report to the minister. Uh, and the uh, minister then submitted this report to the Auditor General uh, to assist the Auditor General conduct their own audit uh, with respect to the border fence project. Then the minister also requested after the 19th of June to uh, share this report with the SIU to conduct a quality assurance review, taking into account that the SIU had in fact seconded several members of the of the unit to the investigation team. 
The SIU provided feedback in July and certain changes were effected to the report where the SIU found certain possible errors and gave advice on how to better reflect some of the findings. And upon the conclusion of all of these processes, a final report was issued to the Auditor General and the SIU on the 27th of July, 2020. Now, what we'd like to also add the chairperson and members of the committee is that on the 31st of July, 2020, uh, the minister engaged the Auditor General for the purpose of receiving an update on the audit. And the Auditor General then noted that the investigation report uh, conducted and the investigation conducted by the department uh, covered a large proportion of the audit procedures that the Auditor General planned to conduct. And the Auditor General then resolved to uh, take a different approach and not uh, repeat what has already been done, already been done and to consider the investigation report in the context of their own regularity annual audit, as well as to undertake to follow up the implementation of all the recommendations arising from the investigation. Further to that, another important development took place on Thursday, the 23rd of July, 2020, where the president uh, signed a proclamation mandating the SIU to investigate any unlawful or improper talk conduct in the procurement of goods or services related to the COVID-19 phenomenon. And uh, our investigation report now becomes part of this proclamation process, given the fact that we've referred our report to the SIU for further processing and uh, civil litigation. Chairperson and members of the committee, moving on to slide number nine and slide number 10, the findings of the investigation um, constitute uh, a number of irregularities uh, the first one of a general nature is that the investigation as a whole revealed a series of uh, procurement and other irregularities uh, throughout the infrastructure delivery process and also possible acts of fraud with respect to payments made in advance to the contractor as well as the, the uh, principal agent. Uh, second of all, with respect to the irregular emergency uh, procurement and payment processes, the irregularities in this regard, they relate to how the emergency procurement and payment processes were applied in the appointment and payment to the contractor and principal agent. And the investigation found that as a result of the incorrect application of emergency processes, the awards that were made are invalid and the payments made uh, against the contract would therefore be irregular and classified as irregular expenditure. With respect to the irregular advance, made to the principal agent and the contractor. The investigation also found that the effecting of an advance payment of 21.8 million to the contractor and 1.8 million rands to the principal agent within days of their respective appointments was wrong as no material was delivered uh, on site and, and, and then construction had not yet commenced. So um, those were some of the general findings with respect to procurement malpractice on slide number 11. The investigation found that from the point of view of testing the market, it is apparent that the department failed to test the market in this uh, regard, and uh, at least to determine the reasonableness of the contractor's pricing. That we dealt with one contractor and one individual uh, company, and uh, we ought to have tested the market to, to determine whether or not we were receiving value for money uh, and uh, that we were receiving the best possible deal uh, for the department. And uh, we did not do that. And uh, further, the procurement framework, as we get to know it, of bid evaluation, bid specification, and bid adjudication was not properly followed. We also found that from the bid adjudication processes, uh, both uh, the uh, national bid adjudication committees who adjudicated the appointments of the contractor and the principal agent, they failed to ensure that a proper SCM process were followed before these awards were tabled before them and before they approved those awards. With respect to the emergency process, we found that the remaining contractors, there were two other contractors who attended the site meeting. Um, the other contractors were unable to participate and compete in a fairly construction procurement process as the appointment of this particular contractor was predetermined. So we had the opportunity to, to receive bids from others, but we did not follow that process. We dealt with one organization whose appointment was predetermined. 
further to that with respect to compliance with the regulatory framework. In all of this, the, the ultimate finding is that the, this process failed to achieve their objectives of a competitive, transparent, reasonable, and procurement process, which makes it irregular in terms of the constitution, as well as the departments and the treasury regulations in this regard. And Chairperson and members of the committee, what I want to say is that where we pursue emergency procurement processes, we still require to follow the requirements of a competitive, transparent, reasonable, and fair process. Mm. There are only certain exemptions, and they, that exemption relates mainly to an exemption uh, to go out on a public invitation to invite birds. But largely, the procurement process must still meet these requirements. Following from that on slide number 12, with respect to technical deviations uh, and misalignment of technical specifications, an assessment conducted by the professional review team, that is our PICC team, technical unit, they found that the items on the bill of quantities, the drawings, the specifications, and the work as built finally indicated that these were not aligned. The assessment also found that the fence was not in compliance with the drawings and the specifications. With respect to value for money, the value for money assessment concluded that the, uh, the, uh, the, the contract uh, showed up significant anomalies. The total project cost, which includes an engineering fees, was 40.4 million rand, and the contract was contracted at 2016 prices. That is the repairs and maintenance contract between the department and the contractor was appointed. Their old contract was used as a baseline or benchmark to calculate the prices. And although it was calculated at the 2016 prices on an earlier contract, the evaluation by the technical team indicated that some of the items quoted in our border fence contract was not in fact based on these 2016 prices. This includes also site establishment costs, which exceed 1 million rands, and which not have been charged uh, given the fact that the, the, the award claimed that this particular contractor was already established on site and ready to start work. So site establishment costs should never have been charged. It exceeded a million rands. And excessive unit rates were also charged specific item for charge for specific items. So using the 2016 contract rates at mm. which the project was contracted, the assessment found that the overall cost should have amounted to 26 million uh, and therefore was overpriced by 14.3 million rands. Further to that, the technical team also took the items in the bill of quantities that were used on the project and they compared it to today's prices at 2020 which we call market-related pricing. And they found that the total project cost should have been 23.3 million rand at today's prices. This indicates that the project cost was exceeded by 17 million rand. And it's then apparent that as a department, we did not review the bill of quantities properly. And consequently, uh, this resulted in the contract price being inflated. It also reflects the, our failure to test the market, that we were left ourselves vulnerable and gave the contractors a blank check by failing to test the market. So this means that the 2020 market per comparison indicates that even the 2016 prices were inflated at the time, although this is not from part of the scope of our investigation. Chairperson and members of the committee, I go on to slide number 14, the findings with respect to lack of fitness to mitigate border threats. Now the border threats relate primarily to the fence and the ability of the fence to keep people out, uh, people breaching the fence is what we refer to as a, as a border threat. And the threat can come from the inside of the country or the outside, so it works on both ends. And, and, and primarily what you have is that the fence really works as a, on its own. It must work together with detection mechanisms, uh, such as sensors, and also a response mechanism where in the event that the sensor picks up a breach, there's a response team. To, uh, to respond to a particular breach. So these three, the uh, defense, the sensors, and the response mechanism, they need to work together uh, in unison with each other. Now, in terms of uh, the findings with the, the ability to mitigate border threats, the poor construction practices uh, were found to compromise the effectiveness of the fence as a deterrent for crossing the South African border with Zimbabwe. Because we find a fence on its own cannot prevent, it only deters. In this regard, the technical team found 
that barbed wire coils were stretched beyond its recommended effective limit, which makes it easier to scale the fence. These factors also undermine the effectiveness of the fence to mitigate the border threats. With respect to non-compliance with design specifications, the technical assessment also finds that significant elements of the border fence project were not implemented at all. For example, the design of the fence had a final height of 2.2 meters with angle uh, contraptions on either side, and the final height of the fence reached no more than 1.8 meters, making it more scalable. With respect to breaches of the fence and non-compliance with site clearance, we conducted a site visit on the 4th and the 5th of May 2020, where we recorded at least 115 breaches of the fence, uh, which uh, may have resulted in an untold number of unlawful crossings between South Africa and Zimbabwe. The construction of the fence is also in material breach with the conditions of the provisional site clearance that was granted. And we found that there were breaches of environmental regulations as well as deviations from the approved line of construction. The chairperson and members of the committee, what all this does is with respect to the fitness to mitigate border threats. Mm -hmm. The fence was constructed to mitigate border threats. And we find that even the non-compliance with aspects of the design specification, as well as poor construction practices, together with the absence of a combined strategy of, of, of detection and response to prevent unlawful crossing within the range of the project, in our, in our view, the fence is not fit for purpose and the current payments are uh, regarded as fruitless expenditure. Chairperson and members of the committee in slides 15 and 16, we commence with the recommendations. Various recommendations were made. The one uh, uh, refers to disciplinary uh, charges. The disciplinary charges have been recommended against 14 uh, officials of the department as a result of a range of alleged acts of misconduct perpetrated during the procurement and construction phases of the project. The uh, Deputy Director General Corporate Services, who is present in the meeting, has been instructed to facilitate processes in this regard, and this is in progress. With respect to several recommendations, it is recommended that the Bay Bridge Border Fence Project should be processed in terms of the Presidential Proclamation, uh, referred to earlier mandating the SIU to investigate COVID-19 related projects and to bring this matter before the SIU tribunal to first of all declare both these contracts invalid on account of the irregular procurement processes, as well as to request the tribunal to make a just and equitable order based on the evidence submitted. And the report in this regard is with the SIU uh, for further processing. With respect to criminal charges, it is also recommended that the department should register a criminal case for fraud against the principal agent, the main contractor, and identified officials for misrepresenting to the DPW that project progress was achieved and consequently material was delivered on site on the 25th of March to justify a progress payment when this was not the case and for financial misconduct where appropriate. The department should soon refer this matter to the steps upon the conclusion of the SIU proclamation. Moving on to slide number 17, with respect to restriction from doing business with the government, the principal agent as well as the main contractor must be restricted from doing business with government subject to the applicable relevant due process and national treasury concurrence pursuant to an examination of the findings of the investigation where it was found they acted in an irregular manner in their respective engagements with the DPW. With respect to the the uh, principal agent in particular. Uh, we also want to refer the matter to the Council for the Built Environment, as well as the Engineering Council of South Africa. We find that the principal agent failed to act in the interest of the department and accordingly breached their fiduciary duty towards DPWI. Chairperson and members of the committee on all our construction contracts, we follow this approach of appointing a contractor and then a consultant to oversee the work. These consultants owe us a duty, and many of our failures are a result of the breach of their fiduciary duties towards uh, the department uh, and accordingly towards government. So this is evident in this particular principal agent initiating and certifying a project a progress payment where no progress was achieved on the project, as well as overseeing the development of an overstated bill of quantities that placed the department at risk of financial abuse 
and exploitation. This forms the basis of the recommendation to refer this particular principal agent to the Council for the Built Environment, as well as the Engineering Council of South Africa. And I can say, uh, Chairperson and members of the committee, that uh, this recommendation has already been referred to the Council for the Built Environment for further processing. With respect to the uh, Department of Environmental uh, Affairs, Forestry and Fisheries, as the constructed fence deviates from the approved border fence line and is in material non-compliance with environmental laws, we also recommend that the department should report this to the Department of uh, Environment, Environment, Forestry and Fisheries to correct the non-compliance in this regard. To page 18, with respect to systemic recommendations, we've also recommended uh, that the department should uh, conduct appropriate training in the organization and be made aware that the systems of governance and the rules have not been suspended as a result of uh, COVID-19 related emergencies. We've also recommended that the CFO should uh, review the supply chain management uh, processes and uh, use the service provider the department is already appointed to conduct proper due diligence on 10 processes. But what we find here, yeah, Chairperson and members of the committee, is that there's a human failure, uh, that the rules and the system is in place. We fail to comply with it. With respect to further systemic recommendations on a broader context, the Chairperson and members of the committee, that any board offense initiative should be located in the context of the program of an integrated national strategy best practice and a border management and master plan that is being led by the Department of Defense and the SCNDF. And this must be duly aligned to the uh, recently established Border Management Authority in terms of the Border Management Authority Act of 2020. Now, Chairperson, moving beyond the investigation and our processes moving forward, um, we have taken due cognizance of uh, the number of individuals and companies that um, are the subject of uh, the recommendations for action uh, in terms of the investigation. And in terms of uh, natural justice, we would re be required to ensure that officials who have been implicated in misconduct in the investigation report, they be given the opportunity to give their side of the story uh, uh, against the allegations level against them. And uh, we, we believe that uh, where we we, we put untested uh, allegations out there. When we say untested, we mean untested in, uh, in, a, in an independent tribunal, um, which, what, which is what the disciplinary process uh, would, uh, would require us to do. Uh, we would uh, compromise these processes and uh, also um, uh, place our employees uh, at the risk of being unfairly qualified as a result. And this will also compromise uh, administrative fairness in terms of the Labor Relations Act. So uh, in terms of uh, us complying with the requirements of, of PAJA, um, we need to maintain the rights um, of the individuals who have been uh, implicated, so implicated, and ensure that we maintain the confidentiality of the processes and give them a chance to defend themselves. Now, with respect to ongoing engagements of the committee on slide number 22, um, there are various uh, engagements uh, that is, uh, are being planned with the committee going forward. Um, as slide number 20, uh, 22, um, it's both ourselves as a department, the Auditor General, as well as the SIU, uh, plan for the engagements uh, with the committee. With respect to ourselves as a department, after the conclusion of, of all of the relevant processes to give effect to the recommendations of the report, including the SIU proclamation processes, the criminal investigations and the consequence management and, and, and disciplinary processes in the department, we will share the, the outcomes of all of these uh, with the committee. With respect to the Auditor General, as mentioned earlier, the Auditor General has already indicated that the majority of their planned audit procedures were already covered as part of the investigation. And uh, we engaged them fairly early with the draft reports that they were able to conduct these assessments and read the reports thoroughly as well on their side. And uh, the office uh, has indicated, the office of the Auditor General, they indicated they consider the impact of the investigation outcomes as part of their annual audit. And in particular, they will follow up and hold us to account for the implementation of the recommendations arising from this investigation. That uh, uh, was communicated in writing to the minister uh, on the 31st of July, I believe. 
Uh, further to that, uh, Jefferson, the proclamation uh, that the ICIU has from the president uh, on the 23rd of July, significant in this regard, we, we are aware that uh, after referring this report to the SIU, that um, this particular paid bridge investigation report is now part of the scope of work of the SIU to uh, review and uh, litigate in this regard and bring the matter be before the SIU tribunal. The SIU tribunal is very similar to any, any high court when application can be brought uh, for, for certain orders. And in this regard, uh, we'll be bringing, um, based on the evidence that is submitted, we would uh, ask the tribunal to set aside these uh, contracts, these awards, as irregular. We have precedents in terms of um, the, um, the uh, rulings of the court and case law, and in particular, the uh, all pay um, case ruled that where there's non-compliance with the procurement process of government, that uh, the contracts are awarded uh, are invalid, and um, we are bringing applications to set aside these uh, contracts on that particular basis, and to ask the court for a just and equitable order, which would require some evidence to demonstrate the value we've received so that we can achieve some kind of equity for the taxpayer in this regard. Moving on from there, Chairperson, uh, it is recommended that the committee notes the findings and recommendations arising from our investigation into the border fence project and also notes the processes to effect these recommendations as well as our future plan engagements of the committee uh, upon the conclusion of some of these processes. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Thank you, Minister and, and Acting DG. Um, honorable members, we have then received uh, two reports, um, which we also are part of the package that, that we have. I will then uh, uh, I ask members to, to deliberate on, on these two reports. Um, I've not yet seen any hand. So what I will do is that I will, okay. I will, what I was going to do is that I was going to call all of you. It's, it's strictly three minutes for now. And then we will give you one minute when we, okay, let me use the hands that are here. Honorable Shabalala, Honorable Siwisa, Honorable Higlin, Honorable Graham, Mare, I still have those four hands for now. Uh, okay, mm. let me take the four. Shabalala, Honorable Shabalala, Honorable Suisa, Honorable Giklin, Honorable Graham. Then Gengogu, after dealing with those, I will take the, the second group of four. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairperson. Um, and I really appreciate the, um, the, the report the two reports that have been um, given to us and some are clarifying and talking to what we have already seen in the media, but some of them are clarifying uh, some three dotted lines. Uh, with the issue of the tribunal, I am just wondering whether the department is not going to jump the gun in terms of the other, um, uh, because for me, I just want to check, is this SIU tribunal not mandated to take over and implement whatever that they seem a, a, a fit because they are the ones that are going to review the report. Now, I hear the acting DG uh, talking about recommendations and, and some other issues that they want to, 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 to implement. For instance, you have an issue of 14 um, um, uh, staff personnel. And that uh, is already out there in the media before it was even uh, discussed or tabled before us. Now, the acting DGS token uh, has, has mentioned the rights of individual 
And I'm saying, is it in line with the, what we have seen in the News 24? Because even myself as a member of committee, I started to wonder who are these uh, uh, 14. But for me, the issue of whether we see the issue of funerals in the next future, because we don't know, tomorrow someone may die and need this state uh, funeral. But I'm asking myself, what is the, the corrective measures? Are we going to see in the future the panel of service providers as I have seen with the other departments? We have six panel or 10 panel of service providers that will take the tents, but with an open um, a process that is transparent and then and, and also competitive to to all that uh, is interested. What comes first between the mm. the, the the emergency? Uh, um, oh, okay. No, there are two things here. There is AG. There is Price Water Cooper. There is Thompson. Uh, I can't I can't remember the whole name. Now I'm asking myself: If you have AG, you have all the government anti-corruption units. It, was there a need to which come first between Price Water Coopers and Thompson? I can't remember Thompson what. I'm sorry, but how are we are we looking at at paying over and above, uh, having uh, used the internal uh, uh, units? How much are we talking about in terms of paying to Price Water Coopers, and how much are we talking about in terms of uh, uh, Thompson. And uh, according to, to to what I have seen when I did my research, was that there is uh, something talking about this uh, firm, uh, Thompson, that they have already done the work previously uh, in the department uh, around the issues of investigation. Uh, was it about taking the old files and reviving them? I, I don't understand. But for me, is that are we placing the value for money? How much has been paid to Price Water Coopers? Don't say. Thank you very much. Can we can we please not 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 do what Honorable Shabalala has done? Uh, she exceeded her two minutes. Uh, please, uh, honorable members, I don't want to say you must stop. Uh, honorable Shabalala uh, is followed by Honorable Hicklin. Uh, no, Honorable Suisa, Honorable Hicklin, Honorable Graham Mare. In that order, Honorable Thank members. Thank you, Chair. Um, I will start with the, with the report on the suspension of the DG whereby Crochet Events was involved yet again, it was awarded to run again another funeral. I don't know how it happens when they've inflated funerals, past three funerals, and then they are again given to run the funeral of Ubabum Langin. I, I don't know what informed the decision. And then coming to the same report of the DJ, has any other of the officials been suspended also? Or are they still active on their duties in the Department of Public Works? Uh, Chairperson, coming to the report of the board offense, one has to go back to the previous report that was presented a few, if I think it's a, two months back. They gave us a good report about the board offense. They issued pricing. The issue of pricing was raised by the committee. And then the department defended that. The issue of same contractor for all borders was raised. It was also raised in here. And what I find very disturbing is that in that previous report, we are told that daily reports were given to every day, whatever happens on the site, daily reports were given. But today we are told that at the later stage, it was only found out that Prices were inflated. I don't know what happened in that. Minister, don't you think we are at a point whereby we need to start our own construction company? Because your own acting DG has just said that 
it seems as if we are lacking to check on the prices. Even the ones from 2016, there's a possibility that they were inflated. But that's not the issue today. But where we are standing is that the prices were based on the scale of 2016, but again, we exceed that with a certain million. And it seems as if it be, it's becoming a norm in the Department of Public Works that prices are being inflated. We saw it with the funerals, we are seeing it with the border fences. And again, coming back to the previous report, linking it to today's report again, in the previous report, it's clearly stated that parts of the events were not structurally sound before the new investigation could go on. But still you give the same company, the same contract to erect another fence. And then again, we get the report that the fence is not constructed properly. Again, there are some loopholes. The measurements are not there. I want to ask you that if you say 14 officials have been taken in for disciplinary, why can't we hold you accountable as a minister of this department to say that you should have seen all of these things that they are happening? Why can't you hold the DG accountable? Why can't we hold the DDG accountable? Why can't we hold you accountable? Because at the end of the day, the part stops with you to ensure that everything happens according to the way it's supposed to happen. Everything ends. It takes me back again, Minister, and I'm going to say that every time when we meet here, that you have decreased the amount of monitoring and evaluation in your department. That is why we are sitting with crises whereby there is no proper monitoring that is happening. So Minister, I think we are at a point now to do away with the tenders, to do away with companies and take the mandate as it is of the Department of Public Works and start that construction company mm. so that we must cut off on this inflation prices that are happening because it seems as if more looting is going to happen, more chowing of money is going to happen unless we get that construction company on board and so that that the Department of Public Works should be able to take into consideration their mandate because at the end of the day, Minister, you are the custodian of the property of government. It all comes down to you. It all comes down to you that we must get all the infrastructure that is needed. Question that I'm going to ask Minister is that, has this particular company been removed from any other projects because in the previous uh, uh, meetings we've heard that the same company is responsible for all border entries in South Africa. Are we not going to find ourselves that we sit with the same problem of inflated prices by the same company because it seems as if it's becoming a norm that your department keeps the same company to do most of the work. So. What is happening with this company? Has it been removed from all other contracts? Has it been removed from your database? And even the Crochia Events Company, has it been removed from your company? Because you've got a lot of other companies that also need to move forward and also be able to employ other people. We can't be giving money to the same company every time that's inflating prices. Thank you, Chair. Honorable Higlin. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm not going to go into the funerals. I'm going to concentrate solely on the Bait Bridge border. I have to just start off by saying that in the history of uh, my observations of politics, I think the speed of light applied to this project from day one. The state of disaster was uh, announced on the 15th of March and by the 25th and 26th of March, contracts for the uh, renewal or the erection of a border fence was, were already awarded. That must be the greatest speed ever known to the history of man. Uh, by the 25th of April, a moratorium on payments for um, the, the border fence had already been placed because alerts were already, uh, red lights were already blinking. Um, 21.8 million rand had been paid to the contractor. 
1.8 million rand had been paid to the project manager. And I ask myself, how is it humanly possible that we now find out that 14 senior officials are being implicated for their alleged acts of misconduct? How is it humanly possible? These issues have been raised by previous colleagues. What I want to say is very simply what has been said by um, Honorable Siwisa, Minister, the buck stops with you. The buck very definitely stops with you. Stop looking for scapegoats. We need to see people wearing orange overalls. And I'm not talking about EPWP overalls here. We have to start looking at people in this department who are skimming money out of our coffers. We are talking about people who are charging inflated prices based on 2016 prices that are overinflated in excess of 14 million rand, some saying in excess of 17 million rand, based on 2016 prices. We are sitting in August 2020. How is that humanly possible for overinflated pricing on inferior workmanship on a border fence that can be cut with ordinary wire cutters that do not meet ordinary standards, much less high standards that have to protect a border to protect our country from illegal people crossing into this country on a regular basis. 115 breaches of a border fence that we could hang washing on. I rest my case. Thank you, Honorable Hicklin. Honorable Graham Murray. Thank you, Chair. Um, I would like to start with respect to um, the minister um, denying that she had knowledge of the principal agent. Um, that's actually just already been disputed by the acting DG in that a principal agent is appointed on every single project um, that the Public Works Department undertakes. But also I, I have um, information where a Mr. Charlie, who is an advisor in the um, minister's office, was on site with the principal agent and the contractor on the 17th of March um, and actually had interactions with both um, parties on that date, including the SANDF um, as well as um, the other um, role players of the department. And also that on the 18th of March, Mr. Charlie and Melissa Whitehead were involved in discussions with respect to the procurement processes on the border fence project. So um, I'm not sure how the minister was unaware of the principal agent cost. The minister referred this matter to the Auditor General, but it is my understanding that on an inquiry from um, an entrepreneur um, on the 8th and 9th of April, the minister's own legal representative, Nadine Fouri, actually vetted the entire process and declared that the procurement processes that had been undertaken were, were correct and okay. Um, my question there is, was this entire thing referred to internal audit um, or internal legal services before it was referred to the Auditor General? And if not, why not? With respect to the SIU, I have a copy of a letter that was sent by um, the suspended Director General to the SIU, remonstrating them for undertaking an investigation into this project um, under the instruction of Mr. Faisal. Um, and without the knowledge seemingly of the Minister and the Director General. Um, but this presentation we've seen says that the Minister instructed the SIU. Is there any way that we can see um, the Director from the Minister to the SIU giving them those instructions? The investigation team, we haven't seen their report and we haven't seen the technical report. Um, nor have we seen the report that was um, done by National Treasury um, on behalf of SCOPA. Would we have access to any of those reports? With respect to the findings, um, from where did the irregularities emanate? Was it an incorrect directive? There was a variation order mentioned in a previous briefing to appoint the existing contractor, given that they were already on site. 
did this form part of the minister's directive, the variation order? And can we have sight of the minister's directive? Um, who had predetermined the contractor? In other words, whose decision was it? In terms of the technical specifications, in a response to a question dated the 20th of May, um, we were informed that the project was signed off by an engineer and that they were still awaiting the supplier's warranty. The components we had asked were, were they off the shelf components or were they specifically designed? We were advised that the components were off the shelf and that they were installed according to these specifications. With respect to value for money, the minister cited on several reasons um, for the high costs of the fence in a number of interviews, um, such as the fact that it was logistically challenging, that the, the fast track nature of the job. You also stated, Minister, that all checks and balances had been followed in an interview uh, on the 18th of April, um, and that the method of procurement and the appointment of the service provider was vetted and approved by the, the um, Bid Adjudication Committee. I also asked several times in meetings about the 2016 prices and why they were so hyperinflated if the reasons being provided for the costs in 2020 were the logistics, the fast track nature of the job, et cetera. Nobody's been able to answer that question. So then from a response to a colleague, the specs of the fence in your response minister were that the, that the fence would be 1.8 meters in alignment with the existing fence that, that was there. So um, what was the design spec on this? Um, according to the response to a question on the 1st of June, Machwa, the company that were appointed, have got six completed projects, two projects in final delivery stage, one in practical completion, and six under construction. Will a review be done of the projects undertaken by this company to ascertain whether or not this has happened before? And have any new projects been awarded to them since the 1st of June 2020? In terms of your environmental issues, how is it possible that there was a deviation from the fence line? And with that having been done, which countries actually gained? Has Zimbabwe gained more of our ground or have we gained more of theirs? And finally, we've submitted a number of questions to the minister around this border fence. And the answers to these questions are contradictory in terms of what we're being told today and what, have come, what has come through under this investigation. What responsibility, Minister, do you take for this? Because us getting incorrect answers to questions directly compromises our ability to do proper oversight. Thank you. Um, um, the following members, uh, Honorable Fans Calvake, Honorable Rumalo, Honorable Dango, Honorable Breitasek, Honorable Fans Tiden. In that order, Honorable Fans Calvake, Honorable Rumalo, Honorable Dango, Honorable Breitasek, Honorable Fans Tiden. In that order. Can please stick to three minutes, Honorable Members. Thank you, Chairperson, and good, good morning to all colleagues, minister, and staff uh, present. Uh, I would like to welcome the presentation that has been made, uh, and I've already been mostly covered by the uh, comments and, and interrogations by the previous members, so I'll, I'll not ex exceed my limit as, as being prescribed, Chairperson. Uh, Chair, just quickly, uh, in terms of, uh, we know that uh, the time, there was a short time frame that the minister, minister gave the instruction in, uh, upon in terms of the Bait Bridge uh, borderline. So I would like to know if the uh, this mandate or the, the, the uh, contractors that were allowed to bid, did they extend that invitation to other contractors uh, or was it only to the preferred uh, candidate that, that uh, uh, took the, uh, that, that rendered the job? And also the preferred uh, candidate, was it the cheapest that was available when looking at the prices that, that was uh, there? We know now, Chairperson, definitely that it was not value for money, seeing that there's already now uh, uh, that 115 holes in the fence. So it, 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 needs to be redone 
and now uh, come the same question and an and, and issue that I brought pro previously that uh, it's clear that it wasn't value for money. So what are we going to do in terms of a long lasting solution, not only in terms of Bait Bridge, but in also in terms of other border lines, because we know and we've seen that this thing is not sustainable, the current uh, specifications that are there in terms of the protecting the, the borders. And then, Chairperson, the last one, in terms of the design specifications that was not adhered to, what is the role or the, 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 uh, the effects that going, it's going to have in terms of consequence management with regards to, to that contractor uh, dealing with, with a, a council of both environment and also uh, possible other uh, stakeholders. To, to, to make sure that that thing doesn't happen uh, again. And then the last one, Chairperson, I want to know when we look at uh, the the uh, what the minister uh, told us in terms of uh, that uh, we were in, in lockdown and the Disaster Management Act ne needed to be adhered to, uh, are we clear or are we uh, satisfied that that is really within the mandate of the minister to act uh, within, in relation to the, the, uh, the Disaster Management Act. And lastly, Chairperson, I just need to emphasize that the department should really get its act in order because it can't be that they are in charge of infrastructure development and we have such loose ends and, 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 and non-compliance at various uh, stages and, and, and projects. I uh, pause there. Thank you, Chairperson. Uh, thank you very much, Chair, and uh, good morning to you and honorable members and the, the team from the department. Well, Chair, let me just join my colleagues in, in, in the issue of um, the suspension of the DG. I think this should be it's a long overdue um, process, and you must commend the, the minister for having done this. I think also um, Croatia events has been um, um, in the in the discussion around state funerals, and which I think, honourable minister, we must actually try to pin down as to why where do they get these prices for these state funerals because. You know, sometimes you get a funeral for about 36 to 37 th th million rands. Just does not, does not make up. What is it that you are bearing there? For me, it does not make any sense, any form of sense when you pull on the ground, the people whom we represent, but eventually we'll have funerals that will cost almost 40 million rands. It just does not make any, any, any sense. And maybe if I may ask a question would be, um, how much, where do they get these figures for, for these um, funerals? Because I'm, I'm just trying to think of a tent, water, a sound stage, and, and those things will accumulate to about 40 million rands. Just that doesn't make sense. Maybe if we can get clarity as to how do they quantify the rates for these minerals and where do they get these particular rates, where do they get their rate sheets from. And maybe then um, I'm moving on to the, uh, the Bay Bridge uh, border um, fence. My question would be, what, what is the nature of the project? What was the nature of the project? Was this an open uh, tender? Was it a selected or a nominated? And what, whichever form that was actually used there, um, 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 why, what influenced that decision to say that this is the nominated or selected or an open tender process that will be used towards this particular project? Um, um, I do bear in mind the, the cognizance of that we are in the national state of disaster. However, I just want to get clarity as to, because it might inform other questions as, as one might be um, um, coming back. Because also, Chair and, 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 and Honourable Minister, Honourable Members, would be that if you're saying that the, the service provider was awarded according to the existing um, 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 project, now this then tells you that initially you had a project of um, repairs and maintenance and etc. Now you've got another project that is running concurrently but, but awarded to one um, contractor. And the escalation there of, of the um, 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 rates, it just does not add up. How do we then account for? Because at some stage you you, you mentioned through the, the acting DG that the specific the specific the, spe, the specification of the project in the bill of quantities 
has got 2.2 uh, 2, uh, meters height, but in the in the actual um, the actual site, what is, what is actually on, um, I'm getting a verification as to what, what was paid for on site. And lastly, the chair, honorable minister, and honorable members will be the issue of the criminal charges laid, uh, the, or that are recommended to be laid to the principal agent and the main contract. Now, as, as, as far as my information is correct, will be that any payment that goes through from the department and officials from the department should be there on site to assess the works done before the invoice and before the interim payment to that relevant pro contractor. Um, so you'll have your own project manager as the department, you'll have a quality survey and all the technical team that will actually assess the works done as claimed by the contractor whether the principal agent or the main contractor or whoever that is involved, so that you process whatever that the department has already seen. Now, seeing that there is a lot of discrepancies around that, do we, as the have certified these payments, and do you not think that they should also be accounted, accountable for and also be laid charges on them, or they also get on, on suspension pending the completion of this discussion around the pay? Uh, Thank you very much, Chairperson. Chairperson, I think the two reports are, in fact, very excellent reports that have been presented. As a committee, I think what we should look at is the recommendations for corrective measures contained within the report on the Bait Bridge uh, area uh, and adopt them as our own recommendations as a committee for them to, in fact, implement. If we want to add further recommendations, I think we should add further recommendations. I don't think we can undertake the work of the SIU. They should undertake their own work and they should account for what they're doing to the appropriate uh, section. Also, Chairperson, the Auditor General is going to submit a report post facto. Uh, that report would have to be examined and the recommendations emanating from that particular report uh, should also be implemented and taken seriously. But I think the recommendations, the corrective measures in the recommendations here are in fact fine. And I think we should adopt them as a committee to take forward. And if the committee wants to add any recommendations to that, I, should, I think we should look at that. Thank you very much. Honorable Prouteset. Thank you, Chair, and, and good morning to everyone. <clears throat> Chair, just a, four quick points. Uh, first of all, I'd like to welcome these reports. Um, it, it takes a lot of courage for the minister to put this out in the open and to, to grasp the nettle and deal with it, and, and we do welcome that. So thank you for that. The first point is in relation to Advocate Vukela. I have warned the minister on a number of occasions that uh, Advocate Vukela is problematic. Um, she can only talk to her fellow uh, former cabinet ministers and they will tell her the same thing. The minister must not forget that it was Advocate Vukela who did not want to respond to questions when we were discussing the APP about state functions. That was first of all. Secondly, the minister must not forget that it was Advocate Sam Vukelo that was involved in the Rusha Bangu deal in Pretoria in 2010 that was a multi-billion rand scandal uh, that involved himself and the current minister of police. Now, disciplinary action was taken against them and those of us who remember is that Advocate Vukelo was uh, dismissed, but through some ways around the labor law, he managed to get himself reinstated. So the minister must take every single step to make sure that Advocate Bukele is held accountable on this occasion and that uh, that the, the, the matter doesn't fall through the cracks. So I just want to advise the minister on that. <clears throat> Secondly, colleagues, we must never forget Section 217 of the Constitution. And Section 217 of the Constitution, that's in all procurement, must be fair, equitable, transparent, competitive, and cost-effective. Therefore, any procurement that comes to any department, any entity, has to pass that standard. Now, if you look at Section uh, uh, Treasury Note 8, 
passed in 2007 and 2008. That's long ago. It made it quite clear that any procurement over 500,000 Rand has to go through a competitive bidding process. That arrangement has not changed. So I get very, very concerned as an ex SCOPA member and also as a former forensic financial investigator when I see statements like there was a negotiated agreement in capital letters as if it's something official. There is no such thing as a negotiated agreement to get a sole provider. That is irregular. It's 100% irregular. There has to be, uh, Mr. Mtiaz has said, there has to be a competitive bidding process. So it was flawed there. Um, then finally, I just want to come to my last point, Chair. Is on the 8th of May this year, I directed question number, and the minister can make note of this because she's going to need it. Question number 111. Uh, in bracket CW123E. I directed that to the minister and I asked her a very detailed question about the bite bridge fence. That question went into the nitty gritty such as the bid specifications and documents, the request for invitation of tender, all tenders that we received, the opening of tenders, the bid evaluation assessment process and the bid adjudication process. So it really, it really got stuck into the nitty gritty of the matter, Chair. The response that I received on the 20th of May, now this is, remember, after the Minister had referred it to the Auditor General in April, was that there was no need to answer sections 1A to F relating to the actual detail of the contract, and that the entire thing had been done under the Treasury note, I think it's 18, relating to special procurement under COVID-19. So effectively myself, and I believe to a certain extent, my colleague, Samantha Graham Murray, we're told nothing to see here, everything is perfect, there's no trouble. Now this report that we received today directly contradicts that. And if the minister takes the time to go back to that answer, she will find the following, that she refers to information provided to her by the officials. She is told, based on information I'm given by my officials, I respond as follows. The minister needs to go back and find out which officials gave her that information, which officials misled her so that she responded incorrectly, as it has now become evident in short, and take action against those officials. And then finally, Chair, I just want to make this point. When members of parliament, and I can only speak for myself, raise these issues with ministers across the departments, I don't do it in a gotcha spirit. I'm not trying to catch anyone out. I'm not trying to make the press. The bottom line is we're trying to advise ministers and our colleagues that there is a problem here and that they must take these issues seriously and investigate. When we pose a question, it means that there is smoke, which means that there is fire. Please take us seriously. We're working together. We want to try and make the South Africa great. We want to try and curb abuse. Thank you, Chair. I appreciate the opportunity. Honorable Van Steden, followed by Honorable Khayi, Honorable Tring, Honorable Jobo, Honorable Mashemble, and then the chair of the select committee will close um, Honorable Maimang. Honorable Van Steden, Honorable Khayi, Honorable Tring, Honorable Jobo, Honorable Mashemble. My, my apologies, Chair. <coughs> Low Chair. Uh, Low Chair. Excuse me, uh, Honourable Matebola. No, I've noted you. Noted you. Thank, you, thank you, Madam Chairperson. Chairperson, um, I'm also concerned about the large amount of money that was spent on erecting this fence, uh, which has been damaged even before the work on it had been completed. And in addition to the fact that it is necessary for borders between South Africa and neighboring countries to be close to control and curb the spread of the virus, there must also be proper measures in place to ensure that these fences are not damaged and adequate patrolling must be done. However, uh, this closure should have been accompanied by proper control and precautionary measures to prevent uh, the government from incurring unnecessary expenses to keep repairing these fences. And the projects must be managed properly and taxpayers' money must be spent wisely. Now, the fence at the Kasha Park in Cape Town is a thousand times better than this one currently at the border between South Africa and Zimbabwe. And independent audit is good. I welcome it. But why not conducting 
also an independent audit and investigation on other matters, which is also worrying, like the quarantine facilities. Or on the procurement of goods and services from for the department during this COVID-19 pandemic. There are big problems there also. Why only the state funerals and the border fence? There is, some, there is something more to hide. Now, I've told the minister and this committee on the 4th of May that she's trying to shift the blame for problems to the provincial departments and departments of health and so forth. And we know what happened at those facilities and the ongoing, ongoing chaos around it. But this department spending and squandering of money during the COVID-19 pandemic is, is extremely worrying. I've inquired from the minister uh, whether her department had awarded tenders that relate to COVID-19 and whether the department standard procurement procedure was deviated from. And she replied back that due to the state of disaster, procedures were indeed deviated from in terms of Section 27.2L of the Disaster Management Act and the regulations of the National Treasury provisions is made for such deviations, even emergency procurement of certain services, items and goods. Now, the list of these deviations is scary, and it, it includes this, this border fence line of 40 million rand at, at Baitbridge. Uh, the total amount of the department's so-called um, uh, uh, emergency expenditure during COVID-19 without following these usual procurement procedures adds up to a staggering 82 million rand. Now, that is what, that's, this is what we are knowing, know of. Um, how, my question is, how will this money be recovered? It is now clear that during this pandemic, the clause allowing for deviation from the normal procurement process procedures was grossly exploited. And it is not even clear whether the contracted companies was indeed able to deliver any of these services. And this has paved the way for extensive corruption that we have seen playing, playing, playing now. And it's now clear, Minister, with all due respect, that you have absolutely no control over your department spending and that you must be held accountable for all these expenses from the Baitbridge border project to the quarantine facilities and the massive procurements, which was deviated from a normal uh, process. Now, Section 27.2 of the Disaster Management Act has opened the door for looting of COVID-19 funds, all of us looting, that we are speaking here today must be accounted for, not only by the by a director general and staff of a department, but also, but also by you, the Honorable Minister of this department. Ministers are accountable, and you are accountable to the National Assembly and the public for your actions and of the actions of your department. And you must also provide us and Parliament with regular and full reports about matters of which we, you are responsible. And you have done that today. Yes, I acknowledge that. But the overcharging of government for state funerals, and I want to touch on that quickly, with an amount of 76 million is actually a big disaster. Especially if this comp if a company, Croatia Events, was not restricted of doing business with government. Why is that? It seems like government likes to keep doing, doing business with, with companies who loot the government for money, who steal the government's money, who's corrupt. Now, according to the Better Life Index, which was released yesterday, the average cost of a funeral in South Africa is, is roughly around 26,000 rand. But this department spent 35 million rand on one state funeral, just one. So I want to know where did the other 34 million 974,000 rand go? Where does, it, where does it went? Now this committee needs answers. Action must be taken and people need to be going to jail if found guilty in, in, in stealing and, and looting this, this department funds. Now, Minister, with all due respect, you must be held accountable for these actions and you must, because you are the head of your department. And that's all for me. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Honorable is he still on? Yeah, yes, ma'am. Uh, no, thank you very much, uh, uh, Honorable Chair, uh, for the opportunity. And also like to thank uh, the Minister and the uh, editing uh, DG uh, for the report. Uh, Chair, what is disappointing uh, with this department? We thought that uh, perhaps uh, the officials in the department would have learned uh, you know, this uh, department has been uh, in the news for bad, bad reasons since uh, 2009. Uh, throughout the last term, it was, uh, you know, in, in, on, on the spotlight. 
Uh, even the point that is raised by uh, the acting DG in terms of uh, the way forward. I mean, those things were, were said uh, were going to be done uh, after the, ch the challenges that uh, the department was facing uh, previously, that uh, going forward, uh, this is what is going to happen uh, around the issues of procurement and uh, all other things. So the, what do the, the acting DG is saying uh, now that going forward, this is what it was said uh, uh, previously uh, when the, the same department had challenges. So how are we going to take what he's saying seriously that there will be changes? Because I mean, it's one department that's supposed to be, I mean, on all the departments. It was a, the one department had challenges, as I'm saying, since 1990, I mean, since 2009. I mean, the officials should have then uh, learned a lesson uh, from those challenges about Inkandla, you know, scandal, uh, all those things. They should have uh, by now uh, learned a lesson and do things uh, properly. It's really disappointing and heartbreaking that today, again, we are dealing with uh, problems, uh, challenges that have to do with procurement in the same department and where it had the same challenges around procurement uh, during the past 10 years. So it's very, very disappointing. Um, it's also disappointing that, uh, I mean, as uh, the meeting was continued, I went to the report uh, of uh, that was a, a table uh, before the joint committees in April around the very issue of a, a bait breach, where we were told that uh, things were, were, were normal, uh, that uh, the, the department and the principal agent were monitoring uh, progress and that there were daily uh, reports uh, that were given to the department and the principal agent. And uh, it's disappointing now that we we, 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 we get this particular uh, a report today. So I wish sometimes uh, when the department gives us a, a report, they should uh, first look at what uh, they table previously and then make comparison. <clears throat> so okay, the, I want to check with regard to the 14 employees that are going to undergo disciplinary processes, whether there are also criminal charges uh, against uh, uh, those employees. And also the department saying that uh, there are criminal charges that have been laid against the principal agent and the main contractor. If we could be provided with the, the case numbers, because uh, sometimes it, you, you get those statements from departments and then you never get any progress with regard to uh, those particular criminal charges. But I also want to uh, agree with uh, uh, Honorable Samantha that, uh, uh, I mean, even before we, we, we were to have this meeting, we should have been provided with all the documents that relate to uh, the, the investigation reports, uh, whether you're talking about uh, the, the report that was also handed over to uh, the Auditor General, um, the SIU report, uh, and also the anti-corruption unit uh, investigating team. If we could get all those reports, including Chair, the, these daily reports that were, were, were sent uh, to the department on the monitoring of progress with regard to the erection of the bait bridge, uh, bait bridge uh, fence. Uh, because we, we should then on our own as the two committees uh, of uh, NA and NCOP uh, conduct an oversight visit uh, to the Bay Bridge. But then the information in the reports, as well as these the daily reports that were sent to the department, will also assist uh, and arm us as members of parliament when we conduct uh, uh, that uh, yeah. uh, oversight uh, visit uh, to the to the to the to the uh, to the site, uh, which is the uh, uh, the bait bridge. Uh, you know, in your in the open statement, I'm I'm coming to the conclusion. Chair, uh, the open statement about uh, the, the the acting DG was a, a kind of con uh, got confused as exactly what he was saying, was he was talking about uh, with regard to the enabling provision. He, he refers to the disaster management act of 2002. And then 
again refers us to PFMA uh, section 64, as if there is a contradiction there, if uh, he could clarify for us uh, which provision was used for, 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 for this particular contract. Uh, but also whether there is any finding uh, around whether a, a, a wrong uh, legislation was used or not, if there is a finding uh, around that uh, uh, particular issue. Yeah. And also the reason why uh, the department failed uh, to test the market uh, instead of uh, relying only on one. But also in the previous report, uh, there was a section around uh, the issue of uh, uh, the, the, the contract is that is based on the schedule rates. Uh, that this was uh, in the meeting of the uh, of April when the, the department uh, came before uh, before the the two committees. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chair. Honorable Trink. Honorable Trink. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Chair, my apologies for coming through to the meeting a little late. Uh, I send my apologies through as I had a previous uh, portfolio committee meeting. Uh, firstly, uh, we want to appreciate the reports tabled by the minister. And I agree with the comments raised by my colleagues on the excessive cost of state funerals. Uh, Chair, certainly it is scandalous that we can spend in excess of 50 million rand on a state funeral and then give 350 rand to our citizens who have lost their jobs. What the ACDP would recommend, Chair, is that a, certainly a cap would, should be placed on state funerals. And this committee needs to take this particular matter further, that there ought to be a cap on state funerals so that we do not have officials um, putting their hands into the public purse uh, and spending public funds uh, as they have been doing on, on state funerals. Bearing in mind the president, I think it was at the inauguration of the state president, he put a cap of 2 million uh, on that particular uh, event. Uh, secondly, Chair, the report pertaining to the Bait Bridge saga found a, a number of procedural irregularities uh, within the department. And so the question here is what consequence management steps have been taken to hold uh, to account those who have contravened the statutory procedures? But then also, Chair, what measures will be put in place to ensure that those officials found guilty during the disciplinary process uh, are not a few months later uh, found in another government department. <clears throat> also, Chair, we also know that there are some officials who resign before the disciplinary process because they think that they are going to be found guilty or know that they will be found guilty. And again, a few months later, they are found in other government processes. So we need to ensure that there is proper accountability and that those officials found guilty with regards to the contravention of uh, proce statutory procedures on the bait border uh, 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 post uh, saga uh, are actually found guilty and guilty and are held to account where they are actually found guilty. Um, and then finally, Chair, I, I believe that this committee should also receive all of the initial reports as well. All of the initial reports uh, into the Bait Bridge Border Post, uh, particularly those, those reports of uh, the department's anti-corruption unit, as well as as well as the special investigating unit. Thank you, Chair. Maybe she's covered. Honorable Matebula. Honorable Matebula. Yeah, I'm here, Chair. Uh, okay. yeah, good morning, Chair, and good morning to, to the Minister and, and, and all other members of the committee. Chair, let me start by welcoming the report. There must also, before I say that, indicate that I had a technical problem um, in being part of the uh, now, Chair, I want to say that um, I join those who, are, who have actually welcomed the report, and uh, we must commend the actions uh, taken by the department in fighting 
and expose the corruption. Uh, Chair, however, I just have a few uh, questions that I want to pose to the committee, uh, Chair, in relation to of uh, the report. One, uh, Chair, I want to check uh, in terms of the Bay Bridge uh, fence that was built. Uh, if there was no a feasibility study that was done. I'm saying this chair because the, the fence, it is said that it was broken down within eight days. Now, the feasibility study should have uh, indicated to us to say, should we or should we not uh, build that type of a, a fence, let alone the corruption that has uh, taken place there. Uh, because now it has turned out that the the issue of uh, putting up the fence, uh, in my view, it was a waste of 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 money, of public money. Because should we have done a public, uh, I mean, a feasibility stand, uh, I mean, uh, study, we would have known that we were going to use money, and after that, they say the fence would be broken down. So now I just want to check if then there was a feasibility start. That's question number one. And two, Chair, uh, the issue of corruption there, it's, it, it's worrying. But what worries me again, Chair, is the fact that when exposing this corruption, uh, the minister took a stand to suspend the, the teaching. Now, I want to check, Chair, in, in the suspension of the DG, there is a report, or somewhere it is reported, Chair, that there was a communication that was made by the DG to say the minister was involved uh, in a procurement process. Now, I, I want to check, check with the minister if indeed that was true, because from the report that we got is that even her spokesperson does say that uh, there was a recommendation that came from a particular uh, appointed company to say, this is a company that should be appointed to do certain work in the department. And then that, communication or that letter was given to the minister of which the minister, uh, you know, gave to the DG. Now, my, my, my understanding of the PMF, PMFA is that ministers should not be involved in the procurement processes. Now, did the minister, uh, you know, take the recommendation and, 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 and gave it to and give it to, to the DG. If the minister did so, I must indicate Chair, that that it was it was not correct for the minister to do so. And should it not be seen as well, Chair, because that because you had some of some we had reports and this corruption that took place some years back. And then we received the reports were received and actions should have been taken. They were only taken only this year. Okay, now, should it not be, it shouldn't be seen as if this is a reaction of the minister after the DG has tried to expose some involvement of the minister in the procurement processes. So, che, that's what I'm, I'm, I'm asking. Another thing che, that I want to, to, to raise here is that you have officials that are involved in corruption who are subjected to a disciplinary uh, process. Now, you do, but you don't, you do not hear, hear or get any report to say. In those officials, there were criminal charges that were laid against them. Now, Chair, I, I want to propose to to this committee to say it shouldn't be a matter of may or may not be criminal charges be pressed against any person to be who is actually investigated for corruption. The minute that we see 
that there is an act of corruption that has taken place, it should be a matter that should as well be reported to the law enforcement agencies so that we kind of try also to avoid this thing that officials, they commit uh, acts of corruption and then after that they, they resign and there are no prosecutions uh, that um, follow them. And they go and work elsewhere and with them it's fine. And normally you would find that they would use whatever that they have in fact to uh, to win some of these cases. But it, I think when you have them reported to law enforcement agencies, when then you have the department doing its work to discipline them, I think it will help to allay or, or, or to kind of try to make sure that the issues of corruptions that we see taking place, they are actually not as bad as we see them. And this thing of waiting for too long to, to take disciplinary actions, I think it should be done away. Thank you very much. Honorable Marcelle, then followed by Honorable Maimang. Thanks, Chair. Let me greet uh, yourself, Chair, the Minister, and the team, uh, my colleagues, the support staff of the Portfolio Committee. Chair, I want to welcome the report as presented by the minister. The first thing, Chair, is that the minister says that we, we can't delve much on the issue of the suspension of the DG, of which is fair, it's fine. But uh, I want to ask two questions. Minister Wu, who sanctioned the investigation? When was it concluded? When did you get the, the report yourself that uh, formed the basis of you suspending the DG? On the issue of Bay Bridge, by the way, it should be noted that uh, corruption is a problem and it should be uprooted. We shouldn't be seeing all of us uh, grandstanding when it comes to the issue, issues of corruption. Now, the minister must be fair and be honest to us, such that all of us, we should fight this demon. In relation to the Bay Bridge uh, issue, what was the directive that the minister gave uh, to the officials? Did he give, give them a directive to appoint a contractor or to extend the scope of work of a particular contractor that was there? Can she give a detailed report into what kind of a directive did she give? What was the role what role did the minister play in terms of monitoring of the project uh, on a daily basis? Understanding that uh, equally, the minister have also sourced uh, within her office. The minister does have a technical uh, advisor who wants to believe that that particular person has the technical know-how of these activities. <laughs> Okay, in, in the contextual background, there is a contradiction. There is a contradiction in terms of the legislations that, that were used uh, as far as the directive is concerned. Which then shows that the minister, as the custodian of the legislation, gave a wrongful uh, instruction. Now you will know say, that the minister is the custodian of the legislation in the department. And when she gives instructions, people are going to take them. The whole matter that we are discussing now, Chair, 
it's in the media. And by the way, what triggered this uh, committee, it was after we've seen media reports. There's a lot of stories reported on the media and uh, we follow them. Some are confusing and all that. The interesting one is that the minister have cleared herself. She have cleared herself against any wrongdoings or anything in relation to this thing. The report that we're having here on the contextual background indicates that from the onset, the minister used the Disaster Management Act as the basis of, of, of a directive instead of using KFMA. Now, I want to depart from the media space where the matter is to punish those that I am saying, Honorable Minister, on the contradictive, which is contradictory to what you should have done. And people took instructions. At the end of the report, there are recommendations on 14 officials who took a directive from yourself that 14 officials who must go under a process, corrective pro measures, after having received a directive from yourself, which by admission of this report that you are bringing for us, you gave a wrongful instruction. The question then now says, after you have cleared yourself, because now from the media terrain where we depart from. The minister is cleared of all of these things. And even this report does not touch you. It only touches the minister on the introduction that the minister gave a directive under Disaster Management Act instead of PFMA or vice versa. But on conclusion, it's only those that took the instruction or the directive from the ministry who must go undergo disciplinary processes. Now, does the minister believe that it is fair that uh, she instructed people and after having listened to, to the custodian of legislation, these people must go undergo uh, disciplinary processes. The last thing, Chair, I'll recommend that uh, the committee must do an oversight to Bay Bridge. There are many gaps which uh, we're getting here. Uh, we're told that the, the fence has been vandalized, the poor workmanship, and all of this. Thing. I think it will be fair enough for us to go there and see. And equally, probably the, the department must, must brief us in terms of their planning. When they erect the fence, 
did they put security to men defense? Because some of us, we understand that uh, once you erect, once you do build something, you must maintain it. In terms of maintenance, we are not saying they must go there and fix it. What security measures are there in terms of manning that particular fence such that uh, vandals do not open it? Let me pause myself that uh, I'll come on the second round after the minister has responded. Thank you very much. Honorable Chair. Thank you, thank you. <coughs> thank you, thank you, Chair. Chair, the, let me start by also uh, appreciating the two presentations uh, I made uh, and, and indeed uh, follow the the, the queue as uh, uh, directed by Honorable Dango to say, uh, let's 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 use the the report as a as a basis for for uh, implementing the resolutions in terms of uh, bridging the gaps and also uh, closing the the weaknesses uh, that were identified throughout the the various uh, investigations and reports. Uh, compiled and that uh, indeed uh, the committees uh, uh, should get those uh, preliminary reports as a basis to be able to do their work effectively. Uh, the, 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 the second point relates to, to the assertion made by the president to say corruption during national disaster is a particularly, particularly uh, a heinous uh, type of crime and that uh, attempting to profit from a disaster is claiming the lives uh, the disaster is claiming the lives of our people every day uh, it's a behavior like a pack of hyena uh, circling wounded prey uh, and uh, therefore i think uh, those identified uh, to have uh, to have defrauded the state uh, must face the full might of the law and, and that criminal charges must be must be opened so that uh, we are able to to defeat the this uh, a challenge of of, of, of uh, crime uh, thirdly the, 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 the concern uh, emerges from uh, from uh, obviously the the context in which uh, the, the appointment was made uh, we know that uh, following following uh, the disaster, the National Treasury on the 19th of March issued a note eight, uh, uh, particularly with regard to to procurement of goods uh, in terms of the Public Finance Management Act and also the Municipal Finance Management Act. Uh, and uh, and uh, and also the impact of uh, of the disaster uh, on 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 the the supply management policy uh, and the directives issued clearly from the office of the minister also uh, create uh, create the basis for 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 confusion or also an environment in which some of the challenges could have uh, could have uh, taken place. But I think what is critical is to, is to separate issues, separate uh, directives, uh, uh, and also uh, a crime of corruption. Uh, but also then uh, uh, affirm, the, affirm the fact that uh, there is work that has been done once uh, an issue of uh, fraud and corruption was identified there are mechanisms that were put in place to try to mitigate the devastating nature of, 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 of fraudulent activities and also corrupt activities. So therefore, based on the, on the report, uh, I have no doubt that uh, uh, the department, the department uh, has set a basis for those uh, corrupt activities to be exposed. And as a result thereof, uh, we are just uh, we are looking forward for 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 
fraudulent charges to be to, to, to be laid by the department so that uh, there is no there's no, there's no delay in terms of the uh, those that are responsible for facing the law. Thank you, Chairperson. Um, thank you, uh, Honourable Members. Uh, there were two questions that were written in the chat box, and I will read those questions. But before I hand over to you, Minister Ndiji, let me add my voice in appreciating um, the, the, the report uh, that has been presented to us. And also, uh, Minister, let's also appreciate the fact that I think this is the only department so far that has acted with speed on the allegations of um, corruption that has been happening during this uh, pandemic era and lockdown era. I think on that one, we, we, must, we must applaud you on, on that one, Minister. Uh, but to Minister, it, it shows, um, I agree with my colleagues that are saying that uh, the the bug stops with you. We, we, we received the reports as this committee. Remember, we were very concerned on the amount that has been used on the bait bridge fencing. We were very concerned as this joint committee. We asked, but we were informed that uh, all measures are being done, monitoring is being done, getting reports daily which means that we have been lied to, you also have been lied to. That means, Minister, you then have to use your powers. You need to clean your department. You need to whip your officials. If they're not doing that, Tina, we're going to whip you. That, that you must understand. We're not going to play around. We're going to come straight to you if things are not happening uh, um, correctly in in, in then my question comes, uh, Minister, um, on the issue of the the officials uh, that are said to be taken to DC. Are you still planning to take them to DC, or are they now currently on DC? Because that will also matter. Uh, uh, minister, if you are saying that you want to clean up your department, which is known to be corrupt, then you need to act. We need not be told stories here that officials are going to be taken to DC. And we 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 are we I also support all my colleagues that are saying that also criminal charges have to be laid uh, against them. Um, that company or that uh, 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 contractor that was doing that short work, that one, he, uh, the recommendations that say uh, it must be blacklisted, they are correct. But is that going to be done? On the issue of the state funerals, um, I, I agree also myself, and I want to uh, add my voice on that one, they need to be kept. Uh, we need to have a, a maximum amount for them. They, they can be. Uh, the reality is that in uh, that uh, Malangeni, um, 35 million during lockdown, when you don't expect many people, uh, it was really um, something that was uh, not good. Uh, it, 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 it smells uh, red somewhere there. How can that funeral be? 35 million, a uh, minister, and also appointing the same contractor that has been alleged since 2018 in these state funerals and even in this one, that contractor is, is again um, uh, uh, taken in to do that funeral. We, 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 need, we need to change the way we're doing things in, in the department. Uh, Ms. Martinisa, can you read the two questions that were written on the chat? Uh, quickly so that the minister and the DG should respond. Um, thank you, Chairperson. It's the two questions are coming from Honorable Brenda Matebula. Uh, she's asking whether the department has a plan to, to start a construction company. That's question number one. Question number two says uh, she also wants to get an understanding whether the department has a plan to recover the money that was stolen by these companies? What plan did the department uh, put in place to prevent it 
for not happening in the future. Thank you, Chairperson. Over to you, Minister and, and DJ. Thank you, Honorable Chairpersons for, and Honorable Members for the questions. I will ask uh, the Acting DG to respond uh, to uh, the technical ones. And I will also ask uh, the DDG for corporate services to give the Honorable Committee a report on the process of disciplinary. Um, and then I will come in. Thank you, Honorable Chairperson. Acting DG. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Minister and Chairperson, members of the committee. Um, there are many questions. I'll just take them one at a time. Chairperson, to talk about the tribunal and the referral of the matter to the tribunal by the department. The tribunal is a, is a setting that is similar to a court. So what we are required to do is to present evidence to the tribunal that this particular contract has not met the requirements of the procurement framework and ask them to set it aside as an invalid contract. And what that will do is it will give us an opportunity to then claim value for money and adjust an equitable order, which means we'll pay for what value we've received. And where no value was received, claims will be made against the companies concerned and we'll be in a position to, to claim restitution where required, but ensure that we don't have fruitless expenditure on this contract. We are fortunate in that there are court precedents in this matter where the courts have ruled that the contract which does not meet the requirements of the procurement framework is invalid. So this is a bit regarding the, the, uh, the, 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 um, the issue of uh, the tribunal. With respect to costs, in the, the costs uh, are about the uh, Cheadle Thompson and PwC. I'm not aware of Cheadle Thompson, so I'll defer that to the minister. With respect to PwC, this investigation cost us 900,000 rand to conduct it by uh, Cheadle, uh, PwC. That's a funerals investigation. With respect to the SIU assisting us on the Bait Bridge investigation, I haven't received the final cost, but I want to also point out that the investigation was not conducted by the SIU. The SIU simply seconded staff to assist us to conduct the investigation and I expect the cost to be no more than 200,000 rand. The last time I saw when we concluded we were running the work in progress at 150,000 rands. Then to move over to um, the removable, removable of the companies who are to, from conducting business with the state. I want to mention that we have uh, the challenge in that we need to follow due process. And this also includes with the funerals, the company that was appointed to, uh, to manage the funerals uh, in the particular investigation why they are also conducting business with the state. I just want to deal with that quickly. It was a common thread among a number of the questions. And I want to mention that we are required to follow a particular procedure in terms of administrative justice, and we are required to engage the company and uh, and ask them why, we, why they believe they should not be restricted from doing business with the government. And we have a restriction committee in the department. The restriction committee is then responsible for processing this information and all of this goes to National Treasury. National Treasury then considers the evidence and then takes a final decision on removing the name of the company from the national database of suppliers to government. So that is the delay, uh, Chairperson, and that is why the same company uh, was involved in the funeral a few weeks back, uh, and they were allowed to, be, to, to bid in that particular uh, funeral, uh, and they were awarded the contract given the fact that they were the cheapest coat but I appreciate that and we will make this a very urgent project to bring these restriction programs to a conclusion. And I want to assure the committee that we will do that. Moving um, from, um, from that particular issue to go to the, um, the, 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 the matter of um, the 2016 prices on the contract. Yes, what is clear, uh, uh, Chairperson and members of the committee, is that the companies, both of them, in the mm. Bait Bridge project, the contractor as well as the principal agent have a number of projects with the department that are currently running. I believe uh, between them, at least between four and six each. And obviously we will monitor them very closely and we will also be looking, we've already started looking at the other contracts to determine uh, whether or not those were properly awarded 
And we found, in fact, that they were properly awarded. And we are continuing to, to, to look at them to ensure that uh, the pricing and other practices don't reflect what we, find, what we found on the Bay Bridge project. What is clear is that the 2016 prices were poorly negotiated. Uh, the department was exploited in 2016. So obviously that sets a red flag and we are following that up as we speak. With respect to the open bid process or, or what process was followed, I want to point out that there were other companies involved um, in the process, two other companies. So there were three companies who were present at the site meeting that took place on the 17th of March. And these companies were given the impression that they would be given an opportunity to coach as well. However, they were excluded and only one company was uh, uh, brought into the process. And that is a company to whom the contract was awarded. And this particular company is also the contractor at the Bay Bridge uh, uh, border post where they conduct repairs and maintenance. So there were other companies involved, but they were not allowed to partake fully. They were not allowed to bid. They were not allowed to provide quotations. So they were excluded. And that's what led to the particular problem. With respect to consequence management and the CBE, we have referred this matter to the CBE and our investigators will be assisting the CBE to investigate the conduct, especially of the principal agent, and to determine what action from a professional point of view they will be taking against the principal agent concerned. Uh, Chairperson, uh, moving on to uh, further questions with regard to uh, recommendations uh, and the criminal charges against uh, all involved. I want to mention it's the companies mainly against whom criminal charges will be laid and we are awaiting the SIU to conclude some of their review processes. They are also advising us in this matter. So far, the companies involved will be criminally charged. Um, we also have at least one employee that is under consideration for criminal charges, but we are evaluating the evidence to establish how many employees uh, are, who may be guilty of making a misrepresentation that uh, work was done and, uh, and that uh, material was delivered to site when in fact this was not the case. At least one employee, but there could be more depending on the findings of this particular evaluation about who knew what. With respect to the enabling provision, the honorable member raised the question and asked me to clarify the issue of section 27.2 and what the finding in the report was in that regard. What I'd like to say is that the minister invoked uh, section 27.2 of the Disaster Management Act. And that particular area of the act is for the minister of COCTA to invoke. But what transpired is that uh, two days later, the minister of COCTA issued regulations which mandated the minister of public works to issue such a directive. So the finding was made, yes. and. Um, Two days later, the Minister of COCTA issued directives which would have enabled the Minister of Public Works to issue such a directive. Uh, further questions uh, relate to uh, the measures to prevent the 14 from moving to other departments. What I'd like to say is that we, we, we don't want to get ahead of ourselves. We want everybody to have the opportunity to, to, to partake in the disciplinary hearings and to put their side of the story. And then we will deal with the outcome of that pro those processes when we get there. Uh, so we wouldn't want to preempt what the outcomes may be. Moving on from there, in terms of the procurement form, I want to confirm that the procurement form was what is called a negotiated process, which means you deal with one supplier only. And in terms of dealing with one supplier, uh, you normally deal with the negotiated process only where that's the sole supplier. For example, if you need a particular product, and this is the original equipment manufacturer, for example, then you can use the negotiated process where there's nobody else uh, available to procure from. But this was clearly not the case. So a negotiated process was not uh, appropriate. And in fact, no negotiations were conducted uh, here. Um, in fact, we very much uh, accepted the, the, the pricing and the bill of quantities at face value without actually negotiating. Moving on to um, other issues with respect to the 2016 rates, I see I've dealt with that question. And also with respect to the funerals, to move to the funerals, there's a question about the 76 million and restricting the suppliers. That is also in progress. And I also want to make mention of something. The honorable member made mention of the fact that 36 million was spent on one funeral. And I want to point out that that particular funeral, 
the investigation found that only 15% of the payments was contractually compliant. So the problem lies, lies largely with our department and how we manage these criminals. And the comments made by honorable members, one after the other, that we should have a cap in this regard. I'm sure the minister will deal with that. Is really the way forward there in ensuring there's no uh, overspending in this regard. With respect to uh, further questions, I see that I have one with respect to a feasibility study. That is also a finding that was made in, uh, in the report that no feasibility study was conducted. And the first feasibility study would have provided the necessary information about the type of fence that is necessary in terms of quality and height. And mm. would have also dealt with the need to install sensor equipment as well as response mechanisms in consultation with the Department of Defense and the SENDF. That was not done. But what I would like to say is that even though a specific feasibility was not done for the Bay Bridge project, there was a feasibility study or site clearance process for 700 kilometers as a whole. That is what the site clearance certificate was issued for. And in this regard, there were certain standards. For example, at the Osho border post, certain standards of a fence was used in terms of what is appropriate with the overall borderline project. But this was not taken into account. So it is quite correct that the failure to conduct a feasibility study uh, contributed in large part to some of the uh, irregularities that were uh, found to have been perpetrated. Uh, with, respond, with, respond, uh, with respect to criminal charges, uh, there was a comment made about the law enforcement agencies. And I would like to say that um, we're working very closely with the law enforcement agencies, as well as the SIU and the Hawks. And we have a weakness in our system in that we have made as a department, at least 40 referrals to the police for further investigation where there are allegations of corruption and criminality. And the SIU, through their various proclamations in the department, have made upwards of 50 referrals to the NBA and the police. But we've had a very little traction being gained here. And we have a very, very low uh, record of successful prosecution. I believe that uh, over the last uh, five years, we have uh, a handful, perhaps two successful examples of uh, uh, prosecution of corruption matters being brought to court. There's a very poor turnaround of investigations making it to court. So we need to, to work more closely with the law enforcement agencies to ensure we have a greater uh, turnaround and consummation of our referrals for criminal charges uh, in the courts. Um, then uh, I just uh, I look at, I, I leave it there. I think for me, that covers me. I believe that the minister would deal with other questions and also Mr. Mchisa. If there are gaps towards the end, I will come in again. Thank you very much, uh, Chairperson and Minister. Good morning, Chairperson, Chairperson of the NCOP, Honorable Members and Minister. Mine is to begin to speak to the processes that will unfold in taking forward the disparate processes. The acting DG had informally indicated to me that there is plan afoot for the cases to be handed over to corporate services to take forward. He has subsequently formalized the process and handed a formal letter last night. So in terms of that process of taking it forward, I've already put a team together, given our previous discussion with the acting TG, where we are going to begin to, to set the process in place to take forward these cases. One of the calls that we need to make in order to avoid cost is to make a determination whether these cases have to be handled internally or external to the department. We have assigned a team within our legal service department from within the regions, there are two legal practitioners who we believe then can immediately begin to run with these cases because one of the things that will need to happen is to go through each of those recommendations and distill them to a point where they will have clearly prosecutable areas in, in terms of these processes, but also begin to ensure that there is sufficient evidence to have successful prosecution in respect of each of these areas. So that work I can indicate to, to the committee is it is definitely underway. And I'm sure in our next sitting with, with the 
the government will be able to, to give progress report. But secondly, the acting TG has already outlined in his letter that he needs a clear plan, not later than tomorrow, Wednesday, so that he can also have the comfort that there are processes that are put in place in order to deal with these cases. Thank you, Honorable Chair. Thank you, Honorable Chair. May, may I proceed? Yes, please. Yes, thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, Honorable Members. Um, maybe I, I can just start with the, the last point raised by um, direct, Deputy Director General Clive Machisa in terms of roles and responsibilities. Um, it is the role and responsibility of the Director General to drive disciplinary processes as far as it's concerned officials within the department. The role and responsibility of the minister is to follow due process uh, only as it relates to the director general. And as members will know um, that I don't have those powers, I will have to report to the president and again wait for the president uh, to advise uh, further. But I also want to, um, at this stage, made it, make an appeal uh, to the committee uh, that you know, we, as, as we have proposed in our recommendations and supported by Honorable Member Numalo and, and Dango, uh, that we allow these investigations to and processes to be concluded. Um, and then we come and report back to the Honorable Committees so that we are not in breach of violating the rights of uh, those implicated in all of this. Chairperson, I will now turn to, to um, the questions. Um, let me start with the issue of the funerals. Yes, it is indeed said that for now we are only dealing with uh, funerals that were what was taking place in, in 2018. Um, we also have to still look at some of the funerals that took place in 2019. And so there is currently a process underway uh, by the, the DG in the presidency, Dr. Lebisi, who in the month of June uh, wrote to our DG um, to ask for inputs into uh, the review of the funeral policy. And so uh, we will then await um, that proposed draft policy to come uh, to cabinet for, for further for consideration and, and for approval. Now, we had to take some interim measures while we are reviewing the policy. And we, we definitely, as part of the review of the policy, uh, did also suggest that we need to put a cap on the amount of um, resources that government spend for official and state funerals. So in the interim, uh, we have advised the department that in terms of the role of DPWI, we are responsible to provide um, infrastructure uh, like a marquee, uh, chairs, uh, carpets, and things like that at, at the official funeral or a state funeral. That it will be better that if public works procure our own um, chairs, we procure our own covers for the chairs so that, you know, we have them in the respective provinces instead of going out to buy. To use the example of Tata Andrew Malangeni, um, again, you know, it was in, in the media. And like members also hear sometimes from the media for the first time, I was also contacted by the media about the appointment of, 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 of the company Croatia. Then I then have to go into the department to source the information. I've subsequently also been requested by SCOPA to present to SCOPA uh, 
the, the whole process, you know, the quotation, the prices and all of that. And, and um, that is currently um, before SCOPA, but we can also make that information available uh, to honorable members. Honorable members, for me, the sad part is that, you know, we are bringing our heroes, our legends who are dying, we're bringing their name into disrepute to have their names been dragged into allegations of corruption. And therefore, you know, until the end of their time and, and recognizing their contribution to the struggle for freedom in this country, we must ensure that their funerals is, is not tainted with any um, allegations of corruption. So uh, again, uh, that process is still under investigation. And like I've said, we can also provide the information uh, to the portfolio committee about the appointment of, of Croatia. Um, in, in our reports uh, to, uh, to SCOPA, uh, previously honorable members, we have reported and we have provided the case number uh, that was laid with the police in, in, um, in Pretoria against this company. And so um, we also are waiting progress from there. So I'm very happy that we are going to look at a review of the complete a, a, a funeral policy and, and how we can um, reduce costs. Um, there's also, as part of the review of the policy, there's also a recommendation and a proposal that maybe it will be better if there's a donation made towards the cost of the funeral to the family, and then the family can then decide how they, they use that amount of money. Of course, they will there must also be a cap. So, Chairperson, if I can move on uh, to the other main mm -hmm. issue that came out around the issue of Bay Bridge. Now, Chairperson, I will be the first one um, under the authority of Parliament to be held accountable. Um, I respect the separation of powers. I think we are all trying to build a country where we all respect the rule of law where we are all equal before the law. So I will never run away from, from accountability. But in terms of the accountability, we then also have to look at the various uh, provisions within our constitution, uh, within the Public Finance Management Act, and specifically in the P uh, Public Finance Management Act, Section 38. Uh, of the P uh, Finance Management Act that clearly sp spells out the role and responsibility of the accounting officers when it comes to procurement. Section 64 spells out the role and responsibility um, of, of, of the executive authority. Section 85 in the Constitution also spells out the role of the executive authority. And certainly if the executive authority is in breach of any provision within legislation, um, again, you know, that can be tested and, and, and any member or, or the portfolio committee, anybody can hold any minister to account. Don't think it's the issue of accountability is, 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 is the how, how we approach it. And so certainly I will subject myself to any due process um, in terms of accountability, uh, using the various pieces of legislation, uh, using our, our, our constitution. So the, um, if, if, if I can now turn to the question, I mean, to, to some of the question, uh, just lastly, a uh, chairperson, since, since June, 2019, um, various systems have been put in place um, to detect and prevent corruption within DPWI. Maybe our systems is not effective or our systems are not being implemented, but I talk here about an outside independent company that has been appointed by the department to do due diligence on all our big tenders. I talk here about um, that we have introduced consequence management, we have introduced contract management, 
But as you know, consequence management and contract management, I mean, consequence management comes sort of after the event. And again, we need to look at um, the new Audit Amendment Act uh, that came in in April of 2019, whereby now the Auditor General has got the right to issue a debt certificate to any official who's found to have signed that particular document. So the overall, in terms of, of addressing the issue of corruption, the, the legislative framework is there. It is now a matter of subjecting these allegations to the legislative framework that, uh, that we have. And I'm sure that is the direction that we are moving as a country. The painful part of the corruption due with COVID-19, why we are dealing with sick people, while we are trying to secure our borders to protect the lives of South Africans and to protect the lives of people coming into our country. These allegations just negate um, the action of government in trying to mitigate COVID-19, which uh, there's no previous uh, um, reference that you can know how to manage it. And, and certainly, again, the process has been take, put in place. It's the proclamation, which we, of course, welcome uh, for the SIU and that the Bay Bridge will also now form part of that proclamation. But also that President Cyril Ramaphosa has also instructed the, the Auditor General to do a live audit of all the procurement of, uh, that happened during, during COVID-19. Um, just last week, uh, we had to submit to National Treasury all the names of the companies uh, that that we procured PPEs from. So there are a lot of investigations and, you know, we need to conclude these investigations as soon as possible because what the public wants to see is that the public wants to see that government is taking action against um, uh, um, a corruption. And also the Bay Bridge report is also part of the Auditor General's um, investigation. And so I think at the conclusion of all of this, I want to assure members that we're not trying to hide anything. If there's any allegations of corruption against the minister, like it's being made in public, that uh, uh, allegations that the minister is corrupt, I will, with the committee, I'm prepared to open up my banking accounts. And that is where I said that no allegations of corruption has been found against the minister. I'm prepared to take it a step further and open up my banking accounts to show that I have not benefited from Baybridge or from any other tender in this department. But yes, the minister has got a role to play. The minister must monitor and have oversight over um, the, uh, the administration. And that is prescribed in law as to how you do it. If the minister or any political head or any political representative, you are not allowed to interfere in procurement but you are allowed to intervene when you say, see things are going wrong. And that is the intervention that I've made. When I became concerned, uh, are we getting value for money? And so the intervention that I've made was to ask our own internal investigation unit, uh, anti-corruption unit to investigate. Uh, we've asked the Auditor General to investigate. We now have a proclamation. And, and let us subject all of these allegations um, before all of these designed legislative processes and let us await the, the outcome. But if any, if any member of the public or any member of the committee who, who claim that I'm corrupt and that I've received money or I've been it personally from this, we can meet again and I'll open my banking accounts. If we can go to, to the other questions, um, uh, and I agree that people must wear orange overalls. 
uh, as soon as possible. Those those who, who have put their hand in a cookie jar, they must certainly go to jail. Um, now, um, I've dealt with the issue of, of, um, of Croatia. Um, just also to say to, I think it's the Honorable Member Van Staden from the Freedom Front, who made reference to the quarantine sites. Um, I can confirm to the Honorable Committee that in my last interaction with the Auditor General, that's currently doing a live audit on all of the procurement, that the quarantine sites uh, is part of that investigation and that the Auditor General will report back to the President sometime in September, I, I, I believe. So that is also subject to an investigation. Um, then I just want to respond to Honorable Brutesh. Honorable Brutesh, I want to assure you that I will always take the committee seriously. That in, um, and that is why with the question that you ask me, um, number 111, Honorable members will see that when I receive a question from any member um, about procurement, I have to go to the department to source the information. And therefore, I will always qualify my answer by saying that the Department of Public Works and Infrastructure has informed me just to show members that the information and the answers that I give to members is what I source from the department. I agree with the honorable chair um, that, you know, I, I also, you know, when people give me wrong information, I also have to verify the information. And I agree with the chairperson. Um, and, and in verifying the information, the way information gets to um, Honorable Brutesh's answer here is that I get the information from the Director General, who in terms of Section 38 of the, of the PMFA is responsible for procurement. But I always try and source the information as best as I can, but I'm not always able to, without interfering in the process, to doubt that the information that I receive from the Director General and the Director General receive from the DDGs, that it's always 100% correct. And certainly there is room for, for improvement uh, there. Um, then um, the, the issue of Honorable uh, uh, Michele about monitoring the process, uh, what happened during COVID-19 is that the department met on a daily basis uh, to, uh, first of all, the regulations had said that DPWI is responsible for identifying quarantine and isolation sites and made that available to the Department of Health. And that we had to cover all 44 districts and all eight metros. So on a daily basis, we met and we also got the technical task team of the PICC involved and we developed a master list. And many companies and hotels and resorts and guest houses came forward and, and we added their names to that quarantine list. But all of these quarantine sites before they could be used had to be assessed and approved by the Department of Health. And so, and one of the questions that was asked by the members, I have made that list now available of the companies um, and hotels and resorts that, that we have worked in. So the daily meeting was the monitoring of uh, the, um, and the minutes is available. We can make all the minutes available to the committee. Um, we, we had a meeting about the quarantine sites and then we had a daily update from uh, the director, deputy director general for construction project management. We had a daily report and feedback also from, um, from the DDG. Um, at one stage, the DDG reported to us that, um, you know, the contract is not saved. Uh, there's vandalism. Some of the material has been stolen. 
and I was requested to write a letter to the Minister of Defense to deploy more soldiers to assist the contractor in protecting, and I've done that. So yes, daily meetings did take place, but we, we received the reports uh, from them. Um, I certainly agree with the chairperson of the, the uh, NCOP, Honorable Moi Mang, that um, all those uh, who are alleged to be involved in corruption must face the full might of the law. We're living in a country where the rule of law and where we are all equal before the law. And like anybody else, you know, these allegations must be tested against them. Um, to, the, to the chair of the portfolio committee, uh, uh, chair, we, we hear your, um, your advice. We take note of your advice. Um, we are open to work with the committee and make information available. We will certainly never try and, and undermine the portfolio committee. Um, like I've said, I do respect the separation of, of, of powers. And then uh, just uh, lastly, um, uh, I've, I've spoken to um, the funeral of Tata and Malangeni. Um, yes, uh, that allegation appeared in the, in the media that we have spent 35 million. Um, when I was asked by the, uh, the, the chairperson of SCOPA to provide information, the information that I have submitted uh, to the chair of SCOPA indicated that uh, the, the projected cost or, the, or the, the quotation received was just over 150,000. And that is also now the subject of an investigation. Um, members have asked, um, two or three members have asked whether we plan to, um, to start a state-owned construction company. Uh, honorable members, as far as I know, there are no such plan to start a state-owned company. Um, we are currently bound by uh, the, uh, the PMFA um, that all, there must be a competitive process. Uh, we are bound by a section, I mean, um, the, the regulations of the PMFA of 2017, where we have to look at preferential procurement uh, with the bias towards uh, black people, women, youth, and people with disabilities. So that is the current legislative framework under which we, we are operating. And so as far as I know, no, um, no policy shifts have been discussed to start a state-owned company for construction. Chairperson, as always, um, I've tried my best to answer as far as I can. Uh, if there's anything that we have not answered now, we will certainly uh, follow up and we will come back to the committee uh, to some of your responses in, 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 in writing. Um, just lastly, Chairperson, subject of the, the, the 14 implicated o o officials. Again, I would, um, like um, um, Tisa said, and the, and the acting DG, uh, the processes have started or they are beginning to put the process together. Uh, we, we, we will commit to come to um, the portfolio committee at the conclusion of that process. Uh, there was just one question about Cheadle uh, Thompson. Cheadle Thompson has not been appointed for uh, the funerals. Um, uh, the, the PwC report, as you know, that in uh, June of 2019, the Aud Auditor General instructed um, the Director General to launch an investigation. So that is separate and that um, how uh, Cheadle and Thompson was appointed for by the state attorney for the disciplinary hearing of the DG. Thank you, honorable chairpersons. Thank you. Um, um, thank you, minister and, and, and your team um, for these responses. Um, honorable members were left with um, 16 minutes now uh, before the end of our meeting. 
Um, I know that there are those that want to follow up. We're going to be very strict with time. Uh, and if you are covered, just indicate that you are covered and and uh, and please don't don't come back. Um, I don't know whether these hands are those previously or they are the new hands, the ones that are showing now. New hands, Chair. New hands, Chair. One minute each. Uh, Honorable Tuisa, Honorable Matebola, Honorable Chai, Honorable Hicklin. I hope that you are noting yourself. Honorable Dango, Honorable Van Staden, Honorable Marcel, in that order. It's Honorable Siwisa, Honorable Matebula, Honorable Chai, Honorable Hicklin, Honorable Dango, Honorable Van Staden, uh, Honorable Marcel, Honorable Van Skalvik. Please, uh, the time is against us. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, in light with what the minister has just responded to the construction company, has the same PMFA been applied to establish the infrastructure South Africa as there is already rumors that it's a process that, that, that is already running, taking over, that is going to take over from the IDT? Another one is that, mm -hmm. um, Minister, you don't need to try. You need to do your job as a minister. Don't try to do your job as a minister and stop trying to shift, to, to, to shift the blame to say, this person was supposed to do that. We are still saying it that the buck stops with you. You've mentioned the PMFA. You've mentioned all sorts of legislations. But at the end of the day, uh, we also, you need to be held accountable and responsible for what's happening in your department. You can't be telling us that you have been protected by the legislature and then other people have to account because at the end of the day, the bug stops with you. And we are still pushing that. You need to consider the construction company to do away with tenders and more looting of funds. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chair. I just want to quickly make a follow-up here. Uh, the minister said that in, in fighting uh, corruption, uh, he, she's more than willing to make her account available, bank account available, if there are any allegations that she has committed any act of corruption. Chair, I just want to bring the, the attention of the minister to, to the act uh, that uh, the act of preventing and combating corrupt activities, uh, which chair states clearly that an, a commission of corruption, it's not only just receiving something out of corruption, but even an attempt of committing a corruption, it is corruption. Now, I want to check chair with the minister that as it has been confirmed by her spokesperson that she made a recommendation to the DG to say this company, which if I, I remember it very well, uh, which is called, I think it's Oxygen, was recommended by the minister to the DG, which was not actually uh, appointed. If it is confirmed, minister, that indeed you made a recommendation to the DG that you, you, uh, uh, that company be uh, appointed. Are you minister, as part of you fighting corruption, willing to step down as a minister to show that you are indeed fighting corruption? Or if not so, minister, are you more than prepared or are you prepared to fire your spokesperson for misrepresenting you that you made a recommendation to the DG for that particular company to be to be appointed to do some work or do a, do a, a service for the department. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Chair. Uh, uh, let's welcome the responses from the minister and the, the officials. Uh, I just want to follow up chair on the issue of uh, document i understand that the, the minister is committing herself 
uh, to regularly brief uh, the joint committees uh, on the progress. Uh, be that as it may, but we, we will still uh, require the, the document, particularly of uh, the investigation that have been uh, completed, uh, that are not going to compromise the, 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 the process of further investigation if those uh, documents uh, could be provided to the committee, including uh, those uh, daily reports, uh, Minister refers to the minutes, including the minutes of those daily briefings uh, to the principal agent and the, the, the department. But also the plan uh, that uh, Mr. Um, Chisa is, uh, is referring to, if it could also be shared uh, with the committee. Uh, that that includes uh, the, the the charges uh, with regard to disciplinary uh, uh, processes, but also the indication as to why uh, those uh, will only be limited to uh, disciplinary processes, but there will be no criminal charges that are going to be laid. Uh, because this could be, you know, the thing about the disciplinary processes, sometimes it could result in a slap on the wrist, so that's why we also want to see the, uh, the actual charges, uh, whether those actual charges go hand in hand uh, with the with the penalty. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Again, I just want to reiterate: um, corruption doesn't only mean an exchange of finances. Corruption is intention as well. Let's remember that. And just one more thing, Chair, um, please, those questions that haven't been answered, and there are many, can they please be answered in writing or can they please be submitted in writing? Thank you, Chair. Chairperson, focusing on the future, why does the, uh, with the, 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 the ministry not invite companies like Danel to do smart fencing with drones and other protection so that we have a, a different kind of, of control on the borders. Thank you very much. Chairperson. I'm sorry. Chairperson, I thank you. I, I welcome the minister's answers and I'm, I'm glad to hear that there's in investigations going on around the quarantine facilities and the procurement of the private facilities thereof. Um, but I, I will reiterate what I said this morning. Action must be taken and people need to be sent to jail for this corruption which was taken place. When we came to this committee uh, in, in, on the 4th of May, um, everything was above board enough. There were no corruption and five months along the line, a massive amounts of money was, was told from this department. So we need for action, we need for people in jail, but we need for people to be accountable for it. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Chairperson. Quickly, Minister, my question on, on, on monitoring, it was in relation to your role in, in, in respect of the Bay Bridge project. What was your role in terms of monitoring the project, not on the COVID side? Again, what, what are the implications of your you? issuing a directive under section 27 instead of uh, uh, section 64. The last one, does the minister feel it is correct for her to sanction an investigation that clears the name and also she goes public in clearing herself in any wrongdoings? Thanks, Chair. Um, hoping that all those that of oh, Panskalve, uh, honor Panskalve, I think yes. the last one, yes. I'm covered, thank you. Oh, oh okay. Minister? Th thank you, honorable uh, uh, chairperson. Um, well, uh, in terms of the, the Prevention of, of Corruption Act, um, I don't know what section or what interpretation that is uh, of the Prevention of Corruption Act. I don't have it in front of me. 
but I will certainly go and look at it because uh, we can all interpret the way the law we want to, but in the end, it, it's a court that must make a final determination of, of what is the interpretation of the law. Um, then the, <coughs> um, the, the issue about um, Yes, Honourable, Honourable uh, Ray, Ray um, we, we stated before um, that, that the reports, all the reports can be made available uh, to the committee after these allegations have been tested so that we don't, uh, we don't incriminate or we don't, we don't violate the rights of the people implicated. Um, we have committed to that. And I've asked uh, the committee uh, that uh, it will be not be fair in terms of the Labor Relations mm. Act that before these allegations um, are tested against those 14 individ individuals, that their names be, be made pu public. Similarly with uh, 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 the charges, um, the charges once the people have been charged and the process have been concluded, again, we've committed to the committee that those reports will come to uh, the committee. But we have to balance the rights of the implicated against these um, um, uh, allegations. Um, in terms of the, um, the acting DG made a reference to with Honor Badango, that there is now this, uh, the, this new uh, border, uh, border authority, which is being established in terms of, of new legislation um, an agency will be established. So what, what we need to do is mm. to, to align um, existing infrastructure projects um, that we are planning um, uh, at all the borders of the country to first discuss that with the new border management authority in, in, in terms of the new <coughs> legislation. Uh, and, 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 we, and, and we will certainly be... Um, <coughs> We will certainly be doing that. Now, um, again, Honourable Michelle asked about the role of monitoring. Um, there are different ways of monitoring uh, enshrined in the legislation. There is Section 40 of the Public Finance Management Act, where the Minister and Executive Authority on a monthly basis receive reports from the administration, from the accounting officer, and within seven days, we have to report uh, to uh, the um, to National Treasury. So there are monthly reports prescribed in law that uh, the minister must monitor. And if you look at those Section 40 reports, uh, there's also a column for remedial action. So the minister must also su su suggest remedial action. So that is part of, 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 of monitoring. I did make it clear that... I have responded to the allegations made in public that I'm part of the corruption at Baybridge. And I will repeat it again. If anybody accused me of being corrupted by Baybridge, you come with the evidence, you come with the proof. I'm prepared to open up my banking account because personally I did not benefit from uh, um, the Baybridge. I've got a reputation to protect in this country and I will protect my reputation with the full might of the law and my constitutional rights. Because people must know that if you accuse somebody without having any evidence, there will also be consequences. So it's in that context that I've released a public statement in response to some of the allegations um, in, 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 in the public. Um, the other issue raised about um, interference in, um, in supply chain management, the Director General followed due process. The Director General put out a, a, a bid for quotations and he put out a tender. And finally, nobody was awarded the tender. So the Director General did follow due process. Thank you, Honorable Chair. Honourable members, we it's only two minutes, but um, 
Let's appreciate the, the responses given by the minister, the director, and the acting director general on, on the concerns and uh, comments that you have raised, uh, honorable members. We appreciate your provoking uh, deliberations. Ours as the committee is always to ensure that uh, um, uh, the minister and the department uh, are in order and also they act according to the laws and legislation of, of, of this country. Uh, minister again, uh, let's appreciate that this is the first department that has acted even before the proclamation by the president that all the, uh, the, the procurement done in relating to this a time of a lockdown and pandemic must be investigated. We, we appreciate uh, your foresight in ensuring when we raised, because we raised it, even before it was raised yes. in October, we had concern as the committee on the issue of the of, of, of the, the bridge. Um, so honorable members, we really appreciate, we were supposed to discuss even the, 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 the our, we have to change our schedules of meetings uh, due to a correspondence that is coming from the House Chair, but we will do that uh, tomorrow, Honourable Members. But for today, we really appreciate your contribution to the committee, um, both the, 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 the select committee members and the portfolio committee members. Uh, I'm not sure whether today we'll still be together or the select committee will be doing its work, but we really appreciate all these meetings uh, because we always ensure that we, we deliberate critical and, and thought-provoking. Ours is to ensure that we root out corruption in our country. Thank you, honorable members. The meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Chair.